Okay, good afternoon. And welcome to the first meeting after the end of the semester. I uh, hope everyone survived uh, and that you survived uh, the commencement weekend. Um, I'd like to go ahead and call the meeting of the Faculty Senate to order. Um, if you've not done so, please um, go ahead and log in on your Seaboard mobile ID app. If you're having difficulty with it, uh, Dr. Ferret right outside here can help you uh, and will manually log you in. He's my postdoc, by the way. We didn't have anyone working for the, for the faculty senate office, uh, so he decided or agreed to help us. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and do a, a roll call from our other campuses. Uh, Potomac State, how many of you are present? Potomac State, two present, sir. Okay. Uh, and WVU Tech, how many are present? Tech has five senators present. Okay, good. And uh, I've been informed that we do have a quorum, um, so we get to have the meeting. Um, and so our next uh, agenda item is the minutes from April 9th. Uh, the minutes have been distributed as an annex to your agenda. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? Uh, Potomac State or TAC, do either of you have corrections or additions? Say Potomac State, do you have any corrections or additions? No corrections okay. or additions. Okay, WVU Tech. No corrections or additions, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, hearing none, the minutes are approved. And uh, I understand uh, President Gee might be delayed in the rain, so he's gonna be a little bit late, and if it's okay with you, we're gonna switch the agenda and have Provost McConnell give her report first. <laughs> Well, we kicked, off the commen we kicked off the commencement season with Potomac State's commencement last Saturday, um, and I ha was very fortunate to be able to uh, confer the degrees at that ceremony. I had never done Potomac State before, I had done tech, and so now I've covered all three campuses, and um, Potomac State's was a lot of fun, so Potomac State, thank you very much. It was just a joy to see your students. Um, we uh, had a lot of events um, this week, and mostly starting on Thursday, we had um, a, a honor, or what is it? The Honor Society, Order of Augusta, International, and the Honors Medallion Ceremony. And that was on Thursday. And then, of course, starting Friday, we had all of the commencement ceremonies. Um, so Gordon and I have truly commenced. Um, <laughs> and I want to thank many of you participated in these ceremonies. I want to thank you for that. Um, you all did so, so much for the weekend. But mostly what I want to thank you for is being the great faculty members that you are and getting our students um, inspired and inspired enough to cross the finish line. Um, and now with our uh, new attention on retention, um, I know that your efforts are gonna be that much more important for our students to make sure not only are they reaching the finish, finish line, but are they also making progress the way they need to be progress up to the finish line. So thank you for that. And one of the things that you should know um, when we stand up there and we shake a lot of hands is sometimes students will share with us these very touching things about their faculty, about why being here mattered. Um, and so I want to share that with you so that you know that every time you touch a student, um, student's mind or heart, um, that it has real significance to them. And um, they're so, so very pleased to, to tell us about um, why they think you've made such a, a transformation in their lives. That's why we do what we do, actually. Um, it's hard to remember some days when we're doing other things that aren't directly related to teaching or inspiring our students. Um, now this is gonna seem um, really uh, a weird thing for the provost to tell you, and you're probably gonna say, well, that's impossible because I have too much scholarship to produce over the summer. But I, I do hope along with everything that you're doing over the summer, you do take a little bit of time to breathe 
um, to have a, some fun, to reconnect with your families. Um, we think that that's very important so we can all come back here um, in August, which comes way too soon, um, recharged and ready to go again, um, because that's what we do. Um, you probably um, heard today about our announcement of funding from the Milan Corporation for our STEM initiatives, particularly through 4-H. Um, we're very excited about their commitment uh, to an initiative that we're calling STEM Care, uh, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. And the care part is really to try to target the feeling of hopelessness and despair in West Virginia among our youth with the notion that those students will be encouraged to be curious, active, resilient, and engaged. Um, and the reason we selected 4-H as the, um, really the primary way of, of serving the state wind STEM education is that what we want to do is take all of the brilliant work you're doing here on campus, um, particularly in terms of research and pedagogy, and we want to put that together and be able to deliver it out in the counties where a lot of students otherwise would not have access. That's not to say that the work here that's going on on campus and um, business and economics, engineering, Eberly, College of Creative Arts, um, Davis, everyone on campus is doing just phenomenal work for our youth and we have many youth programs here on campus during the summer. I want to thank you all for those too. Um, they make a huge difference. This of course the idea of STEM education and resilience um, and hope is something that very much fits with um, our work with West Virginia Forward. West Virginia Forward is really focused on moving West Virginia forward, and one of the things that we have to do is support our youth um, more than we've been able to support them in before. So we're uh, very fortunate to have this gift from Milan. We're excited about what we're going to be able to do. The um, higher education policy funding formula is something we talked about um, briefly, and Matt Valenti, I believe, sent out emails to the executive committee. I don't, you didn't send them out to all of faculty senate, did you? Probably not. So um, you may not realize that um, with the Higher Education Policy Commission proposed funding formula um, that, uh, as Gordon says, it's really a, a process for reallocation as opposed to allocation. It would have t removed about $13.1 million from our budget um, and would have redistributed that to other schools. Um, the only schools that were hit by the funding model were WVU, um, Glenville, and Marshall, is that right? No, not Marshall, Tech, I'm sorry. So WVU Tech, Glenville, and us. Um, it would have redistributed that 13 million one million to other schools. Um, so we wrote a very lengthy um, brief to the Higher Education Policy Commission um, opposing the funding formula. Um, we have a strategy where we've been working with the governor's office to um, have him recommend a blue ribbon commission that would study what is the right um, organizational structure for higher education in West Virginia, not just focusing on a funding formula, but how does higher education in the four years fit with the two years, and are we being as um, efficient in, in delivering um, the educational opportunities that West Virginians deserve. So I'll keep you posted on that, but um, the executive committee of the faculty senate responded quickly and persuasively and also sent um, a letter to the Higher Education Policy Commission, and we really appreciate the quick work of the executive committee. I'm sure if you want copies of it, Matt can make copies available to everyone or place it in the minutes if you'd like to see it. Um, we will continue our opposition to the Higher Education Policy Commission uh, funding formula. When um, we get back in August, there'll probably be a lot more chatter about it again, and we'll make sure that we get talking points to all of you just um, so that you can you will have an opportunity to talk to your colleagues uh, about the funding formula and why we do oppose it. Um, the uh, 
other news that I have is actually all good. The, the first one I want to say is we had the highest number of student Fulbrights than we've ever had before, which I think is a huge, huge progress and step forward. Thank you all. There are a lot of you who have worked with our Fulbright students, um, and I want to give a shout out to Aspire and to Amy Seifert, whose team does an amazing job. We've had other, you know, other successes as well. Um, one thing, I, while we're talking about Fulbrights, I do want to point out, we really are, um, want to um, support our faculty in pursuing Fulbrights for themselves. We have some faculty who have done Fulbrights, but we feel like there's many more opportunities and we have not seized them. Um, so you will be hearing about that from us. We, we are trying to figure out a way to create the kind of energy around faculty Fulbrights that we've created around student Fulbrights and provide greater support for those of you who might be uh, interested in pursuing them. One of the difficulties about faculty Fulbrights obviously or maybe not so obviously to you is that usually is about a two-year planning process for a Fulbright so you really have to focus in on it and uh, do, do quite a bit of planning ahead of time but we have some amazing opportunities. I traveled to Bahrain recently I met with the US ambassador in Bahrain and um, he specifically said that he appreciated how much, much West Virginia University was doing to build bridges in the Middle East and he would love to see some of our faculty doing Fulbrights in the Middle East. So he can be very helpful to us, and I really appreciated his support. Um, we had an amazing demo day in our Idea Hub. Um, our Idea Hub is our Innovation Entrepreneurship Center, part of our um, ecosystem of uh, entrepreneurship across campus. Mindy Walls, who has been the director of that program for three years and has built a wonderful, wonderful ecosystem, is actually leaving for a position at uh, Waynesburg. She was made a tenure track offer at Waynesburg, which she's thrilled about. Um, and she is also receiving um, an endowment to infuse the uh, pedagogy that she developed here through their curriculum. So I want to thank uh, Mindy for everything she's done in building a great program here. And we'll be looking over the next uh, month or so to figure out how, where, what we have in place now in our ecosystem that we've built it over three years and whether there's any kind of structural changes we want to make to it. Um, we hosted a demo day at Evansdale Crossing on April 19th um, where students uh, demonstrated creative ideas, inventions, unique business ventures, and more than 250 people visited the main poster session, including many community members. You may not realize that attached to the Idea Hub is the Women's Small Business Center, and that's the only women's small business center in the entire state of West Virginia. Um, so the, the kind of interest and support um, that's coming out of the Idea Hub and the Women's Business Center is really significant. Um, and of course, we also have the Brick Street Center in Business and Economics. Um, one great announcement, and you, you may have seen this in E! News, but I want to repeat it in case you missed it. English professor Stephanie Foote has been named a 2018 Andrew Carnegie Fellow for her work related to cultural production in and around the Anthropocene, the geological epoch in which human activity has affected the planet's climate and environment. She was selected from 270 nominees She's West Virginia University's first professor to receive this recognition. She will receive up to $200,000 to devote to research, writing, and publishing. And um, this is an example of our office stepping up to support faculty to apply for these. Uh, Ann Claycom, my communications director in the provost's office, worked very closely with Stephanie. And this is the kind of work we want to do to support all of you. Um, in seeking out these uh, prestigious opportunities. Julian Nguyen, who is a Director of Undergraduate Advising in School of Nursing, has been named the National Academic Advising Association's Outstanding Award for Primary Advising. Um, two WVU professors, Antar Jutla in Civil and Environmental Engineering and Brian Pop, Assistant Professor of Chemistry, have just been recognized with National Science Science Foundation Career Awards. Um, Sheila Price was awarded the uh, Neil S. Buck 
Bucklew's Social Justice Award. Um, Sheila is in the Health Sciences Center and is their diversity leader there and um, has been doing amazing work. We also have a student NSF graduate um, research fellowship winner, Anna Gilpin, who's a senior in biomedical engineering from Martinsburg, West Virginia. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Rodney Elliott, um, who's a veteran and non-traditional student in the Eberly College, has been named a Goldwater Scholar, um, which we're really um, pleased about. He is um, a double major in physics and Russian studies, um, which we just think is a great, great combo. Um, one of the things you realize when you go to these award ceremonies and the students are being recognized for their work is you just feel like you c you're nothing compared to what they've been able to accomplish. They're just, none of us probably had all of the opportunities that they've had, but whatever opportunities we've given them, they are using and doubling and tripling them into incredible successes. Um, Emma Harrison was named a Truman Scholar. She's a junior political science major and honors student. Um, and you all are familiar with the Truman Scholars. We're really, really thrilled uh, to have a Truman Scholar. So that is the end of all of my wonderful announcements to set you off on a great summer. Um, I know all of us are going to be um, trying to spend more time with our families and also trying to get a lot of work done. And I hope that you have a little bit of time to work and swing in your hammock. Oh, I have to ask a question. Oh, I need to ask if there are any questions um, from uh, Morgantown faculty, Potomac State faculty, or tech faculty. Tech has one question. Sure. Could you speak about the uh, public comment period for the funding formula from HEPC? Is that passed? Is it yet to come? I, I'm looking for some information. Thank you, Provost McConnell. That, well, thank you. And if you were to look on the Higher Education Policy Commission website, you wouldn't find it. Um, so I'm glad you asked the question. Um, it is um, actually the comment period ended April 27th. Um, we got all of our materials in before the deadline. Um, and they have acknowledged receipt of those materials. It is possible there will be another comment period. We're waiting to hear, depending on what it is um, the Higher Education Policy Commission does as a, a next step forward. But I can definitely keep you posted on that, and I really do appreciate you asking. Are there any other questions here or from Potomac State? Okay, thank you all very much. It looks like our president has arrived. Did you want to say anything, Gordon, or did I get it all? Okay, good. So we do have a, uh, a president's report on the agenda. Uh, did you want to make a few comments? You could at least, uh, how about this, you could answer one question. How are, how are you recovering from the weekend? Um, from my best estimate, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I think, yeah, well, you should use a mic just so that the, the regionals can hear you. So, <clears throat> So the, the provost, first of all, let, let me just say something. Um, you know, it, it, uh, commencement is an exciting time. Um, I, I'm not certain if I've ever seen, um, out of all the institutions I've served, I've ever seen a more um, poignant time in many ways because so many of the people who come, this is the first generation of college student they have and it is just so exciting and, and so engaging for them to be part of this. Uh, and we can never lose sight of that. In the end, that is clearly uh, something that is so uh, important about our institution as opposed to most other places. Um, so, so I really appreciate that. The second thing, and, and I, <clears throat> I said this to Chad, and I've said this to a number of people, I can't believe the time and energy that our faculty put forward in making all of this work, both in terms of just participation, but also in terms of getting people ready and, and, and heralded to be here. So I, you know, at the end of the season, I think it's always important to, uh, Thank people for good work. We've had a great year. Despite some of our ups and downs, we have really had a great year and we're making progress and uh, 
and that's due to the people in this room. I'm, I'm fully cognizant that um, uh, as good as Joyce is, uh, that in the end uh, that you all have such an important role to play that uh, Joyce and I are grateful to be part of that team and we really are. Um, is this your last time presiding? Okay, I was going to say because <clears throat> Matt has um, just been a magnificent uh, leader, both within um, the faculty, but also within the um, within the board itself. Uh, I, I, sometimes you don't get an insight. And Emily, by the way, congratulations to you. Yeah. Well, I don't know if well, we have an announcement. You can go ahead. And announce oh well, uh, em <laughs> Emily, Emily won. How does that sound? Uh, I'll put up a poster. Congratulations to you. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about that, but but you know I I, I think it. I, I mean I'm just I'm just incorrigible. But I I, I think that uh, did you know you won? I had no idea. So yeah, okay, great. So you didn't faint. Um, I um, uh, I I think that uh, you you know I had a lot of trepidation when I came here about having faculty members on the board. I've never had that before. Um, had a student member. Uh, at Ohio State, we did have student member, uh, one student member, but not a faculty member. I will tell you that uh, they would have to take a blowtorch to me now to, to, to remove faculty members because, in a sense, our faculty provide a solidity to the whole conversation and a reality. And uh, Matt and where's Stan? Stan is back there. Matt and Stan do a magnificent job. So know that you are well represented, but more importantly, that the university is well represented by our uh, by our faculty colleagues. So we're we're grateful for that. So, anyway, any questions that I can answer for you? You can tell I'm kind of a little, uh, you know, I'm 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 running on about uh, a quarter of a tank of gas today. As a matter of fact, anyone have any questions? Seeing or hearing none. Joyce, you did a great job. Thank you very much. Oh, hey, and tech, uh, do you guys have any questions? I hope not, because I don't have any answers. <laughs> are, and, and what about you? I have. You have one question? I have one question. Since, since Thank you for the kind words. Yeah, since right. I'm on your good side, um, I, have a, I have a request. Can I get you to sign oh, my, my copy of your book? Oh, thank you. I will do that. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you, could, you could do it when you're sitting down. Oh, great. I'll no, do you that. Can, well, I was going to do it right now. Okay. So anyway, thank you very much. So uh, I'll just say that this, this is a wonderful, um, not because I'm edited and wrote it, but, uh, but, but, uh, but it is a damn good book, and, um, and it's received great reviews. But the one I'm very excited about is the fact that um, um, in, in press right now, Johns Hopkins has it in press, as we have a wonderful book on the future, on the future of the land-grant university, and when that, when that comes out, I'll love to have a chance to talk about that. So I'll do that. Thanks, okay, Matt. Great. I okay. appreciate it. Thank you. Did you actually buy this? I did. Okay. I paid for it. <laughs> Okay, so thank you, Gordon. Uh, so yeah, his, his book just came out. It's called Leading Colleges and Universities, Lessons from Higher Education Leaders. This is a contributed book that he edited. It's got uh, stories from uh, college presidents. He even has a chapter in there from our former president, Jim Clemens. Um, but I'm looking forward to his, uh, his full authored book that's coming out in the fall, which is on uh, land grants. Um, but uh, I did have a few announcements now. Gordon sort of stole my thunder. Um, I was going to uh, tell you about the election results. I, I had sort of a, an American Idol moment. I was going to say, um, and the winner is, and then have a long pause. Uh, but I guess I don't, won't be able to do that. Uh, but <clears throat> the, uh, the election has concluded. We got a good response rate. Thank you for everyone that, that, that voted. I think we had about 80% or more uh, response rate. Um, and so uh, this person, who I will announce in a minute, hold on, um, will be uh, the chair of the Senate um, starting a year from now, 2019 to 2020 academic year. So be chair-elect for a year, and then will replace me on the Board of Governors uh, a year from now. Um, and so without further ado, the winner is Emily Murphy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but... I'd, I'd like to thank also uh, Virginia Kleist. Uh, she very selfishly, uh, she's, she's a department head, you know. She very selfishly uh, agreed uh, to run as well. And, and we uh, greatly appreciate her uh, for stepping up and being willing to do that if she were elected. Okay, so now tomorrow um, we're going to send out a ballot uh, for, it'll be one ballot for two things. It'll include the Board of Governors position, and um, that's going to be part of agenda item nine. Okay, our two Board of Governor uh, nominees are going to talk to you. Um, and then in addition to Board of Governor's representative, 
we'll have executive committee, okay? And I've had a few questions, a few people have asked me, am I on the ballot or not? So just to clarify that, uh, Chad uh, agreed, he's gonna read out the ballot for you, and these are arranged alphabetically by constituency, and he'll also kind of go over the constraints of the election in terms of number of positions and constituencies. If you wanna use the mic. So we'll be electing seven members to the executive committee. Um, we've got various names on the ballot, but the way that the rules work with the Constitution is we cannot have more from, uh, we can't have more than one from any one constituency. So there's a couple of constituencies that have more than one person running, but we'll only be able to elect one from each constituency. So we have Scott Fleming from Business and Economics, Karen Haynes from Education and Human Services, Jessica Bishop from the College of Creative Arts, Ashley Swords from Dentistry, Alcinda Trickett Shockey from Dentistry, Lynn Kosman from the Eberly College, Lisa DiBartolomeo from Eberly College, Robert Bastros from Law, Ann Cronin from Medicine, Bingyan Lee from Medicine, Robert Shapiro from Medicine, Nicholas Goff from Potomac State, Gerald Wilcox from Potomac State, Samuel Amari from the Statler College, Ilkin Biljasu from the Statler College, and Greg Living from WVU Tech. Okay, uh, thank you, Chad. So, if you think there's a mistake, or if uh, you're on the if you're on the ballot and you've decided you don't want to accept, <laughs> just let us know like immediately, and we can pull your name. Also, if you think you were supposed to be on there, um, I guess there was a you know we could probably fix it, but it, you would have had to have been nominated before the cutoff. So, but come come talk to us if you think there is some mistake. Uh, we could probably correct a mistake, but we probably can't take uh, new, fresh nominations at, at this point. So there are 10 constituencies on there, and as Chad pointed out, um, we have seven on there. So that means as it stands now, there'll be three of those constituencies that unfortunately will not be represented. Represented. Okay. So a couple other things. Uh, we do have one more meeting. I've had a lot of questions today. Is this your last meeting? Even Gordon asked that. I get one more, okay? Everyone seems to be anxious to have me done. I guess I am too. <laughs> um, but we do have one more meeting, uh, June meeting. Uh, it'll be hopefully fairly quick. We've got uh, committee reports and things like that to cover. Um, and right before that meeting, uh, we'd like to have a new senator orientation. So it'll be two to three o'clock uh, right in this room, June 11th. Uh, kind of go over, you know, give you a little orientation, tell you what we cover and what some of the rules uh, are. And it's not limited to new senators, so you know, if you're at the end of your first year and you still haven't figured it out, you're welcome to join us. If you're like me and you've been doing it for six years and you still don't know what you're doing, you know, feel free to join us. Um, okay, and then uh, another housekeeping thing, um, in, in preparation in part because of this new senator orientation, I was going back through the Constitution, faculty Constitution, and it occurred to me um, we, we need to do some revisions and edits to the faculty Constitution. Uh, I'll give you an example of some of the language. It says that um, uh, the Higher Education Policy Commission has authority to guide and regulate the university. So I'm not sure if that's true anymore, so we might want to, at a minimum, strike that <laughs> statement. <laughs> so, you know, while we're at it, um, so I, I, you know, I think we want to do a few um, minor updates uh, to fix things like that. But while we're at it, you know, this is an opportunity. If there's a few other adjustments, we may want to change some timelines, some committee compositions, you know, things like that. So um, a, few of the, a few of us in the faculty leadership, um, chair, chair-elect, um, past chair, we're all going to kind of get together and work on it. If, if you have some input, please let me know. If there's something you'd like to change um, or have some suggestions, um, we can certainly take those into account. So for the timeline for the Constitution, um, the way it works is we need to have this presented at the October faculty assembly meeting. It's something that's voted on by the entire faculty or the faculty assembly, not just the Senate. Um, so uh, working backwards, what we're going to do is we're going to work on this over the summer. Uh, present it to the first exec meeting in August. Uh, the revisions will then pr be presented to Senate in September, and then finally we'll present it to the faculty assembly in October. Uh, since we probably won't have a quorum, uh, then what we would do is um, vote electronically immediately following. So it'll be electronic ballot that all, uh, all faculty, members of faculty assembly, um, will be eligible to vote for, okay? So uh, just keep an eye out for that. Um, another thing that, uh, 
uh, Provost McConnell, McConnell sort of stole my thunder here. I was going to give you an update on the uh, Pepsi funding model situation, and she did a really good job of uh, articulating it. But the comment period ended on April 27th. And that was a busy day, and it was a busy night <laughs> the night before. Um, so um, ar around noon, uh, President Guy sent out a very articulate uh, letter uh, explaining all the reasons that the funding model is wrong. And then this was followed up by a series of letters from uh, a bunch of constituencies, including staff, alumni, uh, students, the Board of Governors Chair, and, and both presidents of the two regional campuses. And the fact that the regional campuses had their own letters, I think, is significant because they actually have their own separate um, line item in the, in the budget, and they're affected differently. Uh, tech is actually very negatively affected. Potomac State, not so much. So um, I was asked to write a letter on behalf of the faculty, and in doing so, I engaged the executive committee, and together we came up with the following resolution. And I'll read you the resolution, because uh, I think it's important. Uh, so the resolution that we uh, approved is that the faculty of West Virginia University are fully committed to the mission of creating a diverse and inclusive culture that advances education, health care, and prosperity for all. If adopted, the proposed West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission funding model would greatly impede WVU's ability to serve this mission. In particular, it will inhibit WVU's ability to conduct high-impact research, will curtail state outreach efforts through its extension service, will potentially limit healthcare capacity and will do significant harm to an economic engine that drives innovation and creates opportunities for those who need it most across West Virginia and around the world. So we had that in the, in the letter. Um, oh, and by the way, can I put the letter uh, as part of the minutes? Okay, so I think there was a request to do that. I'll, I'll go ahead and put the letter as part of the minutes. Um, so in addition, the letter emphasized, um, you know, the in my own comments, emphasized the transformative effects of WVU research. A significant loss of funding would ultimately jeopardize our newly earned R1 status, which in turn would impede our ability to recruit and retain the caliber of faculty necessary to ensure that our students are educated at a level that is on par with the other academically competitive institutions around the nation and globe. This is vital to West, Virginia, for, to West Virginia's economic future, as we desperately cannot afford to be left further behind as the rest of the nation prepares for the increasingly high-tech industries of the future. Moreover, it would impact our ability to attract highly qualified students at all levels, but especially at the graduate level, where research reputation is of utmost importance. So in conclusion, I wrote, I hope that you consider the impact that the proposed funding model would have on the state of West Virginia, both in terms of of the loss of personal opportunities for our residents, as well as the loss of economic opportunities. Together, we must prepare for the industries of the future. So that was the letter. Um, and then finally, last announcement, um, as Stan's going to talk about. OK, so everyone's been stealing my thunder. So I'm going to steal yours, Stan. OK, so all right. So um, he's going to mention this in his Board of Governors report. Uh, we're going to have a, a meeting on uh, this Friday, special meeting, not an emergency meeting, a special meeting. Um, and it'll be to consider the academic rules, uh, 2.1 through 2.5, as well as the reduction in force rule, which is 4.7. Now, those rules have all been posted, and um, the comments and responses to the comments and revisions have been posted. Uh, you just go to policies.wvu.edu, and it'll, have, uh, it'll give you an update. Um, so if you do have the time, I, I know you guys are probably a little burnt out from the semester, but you may want to, especially if you made a comment, Please go look, see what the response to your comment was, or you know, if you're curious, look at what all the comments were, and uh, see if you have any further uh, issues. Um, you know, it probably will pass as written. I don't anticipate a lot of um, opposition. So if you have strong feelings and you'd like me or Stan to oppose it for some reason, you know, you can kind of articulate it to us, and we'll we'll take it into account uh, as your as your representatives. Okay. Uh, so with that, that's the end of my report, although I can take questions as well, if anyone has any. Um, Potomac State, do you have any questions for me? Uh, no questions, sir. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Thanks. And uh, Tech, do you have any questions? No questions. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I'll move on to the next agenda item. Um, okay. So next up is report from Misha Poor. Uh, so, uh, Mishapur, uh, relatively new. How you've been here two, three months now? 
two and a half months, okay, I knew I was right. Um, and uh, we had the pleasure to go through several uh, graduation ceremonies with her uh, yesterday. So this is our first time, I guess, hearing from you. So we just told her to you know, spend a few minutes just kind of introducing herself. Thank you, Matt. Actually, what he told me was to be very brief. Um, he told me that, but I will say it's an honor to be here with you guys. I am a couple of weeks in, but it has been wonderful every single day getting to meet you all. Um, I will tell you that we have been busy. I have actually met with Ms. Murphy on a couple of occasions on talking about one thing regarding the university, and she told me that she's going to be a new faculty um, representative, and I'm looking forward to working with her as you all continue your great work. Um, I was able to participate in the Higher Learning Commission visit pretty much actually a couple of days into my coming on board. That was kind of like the first thing they did, and I said, WVU does not waste any time making sure you get ready to fight for them. And so I'm extremely excited to, to have participated in that. It was eye-opening, but definitely what it showed me was the passion that you guys have for this university and what you have for your students. I also got the opportunity to participate um, with the Outstanding Student Selection Committee. There was 100 plus students that we looked at those applications, and that was a beautiful beautiful way for me to see the talent of our students. I mean, to be able to, one, talk with the ones that we did for the Augusta, Order of Augusta, and hear their stories and why they want to be great ambassadors for our university, um, and to see them cross the stage. I went to several um, graduations. Chad, of course, was uh, at a lot of those with me as well as Matt. Um, and um, it was good to see them, because I think that we are, you are doing a fantastic job of getting them prepared. Um, and not only getting prepared, but getting prepared to be great champions for us, to let them see that we not only are producing great talent, but we have great talent in this state. And those that come to our state will also be proud to say that they're a part of our family. Um, I've traveled with the president around the state um, to try to harvest some new invites to our university. We've gone to the Eastern Panhandle, we went to Kaiser, I um, also went to Ann Arbor for the provost to talk about freedom of speech and inclusion. I've gone to Potomac State and talked with them and their leadership team and I plan to go to Beckley next week to do the same. I'm trying to make sure that we're covering all bases because I recognize that we have three front doors. We're one university and so when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's not just diversity in regards to race, gender, religion. It's also talk about including our campuses and making sure that we're doing the same level of work, the same level of education, the same level of values. We all are one university. So Beckley, I will be seeing you in a couple of weeks. Um, <clears throat> I have had the opportunity and will be continuing to work with the Alumni Association. As you all know, my job is across all campuses and across all areas. And so I've tried my best within the, next, the last two months to really get invested wherever there was immediate need, and that's one thing that I've been participating in. Um, We've gone to uh, talk with the West Virginia Chamber of Commerce. They had their statewide initiative, their, their conference. I went down and talked with them about the work that we were doing. We work with Rocky Goodwin for the West Virginia Ford Initiative. We're looking at getting a res research scholar in our, universe, in our office to see how we can participate from the very beginning all the way through this process to making sure that we're really being true to what our mission is, including people and making sure that we're covering all of our bases in that study. Um, I've done several grants and working on several grants with health science to making sure that we are not only doing recruitment and retention, but that we're having a good strategic plan as we're developing how to do that. I think it's good to say that we live in a state that's 98% uh, Caucasian and 3.8% African American, then seems to somehow exclude others. But the reality is we are the beacon of the state. We're the land grant institution. We are the flagship institution. And so we really should look at no limits. And that's how I'm approaching this, is that as we begin to develop strategic plans throughout the different colleges is that we don't continue to stay within what we think are limits, begin to see that there is no box and reach for the highest goal, making sure that we're getting people here, welcoming here, and keeping them here. And so I'm certainly open. I try to keep it as short as I could, but there, oh, bat. Um, but I'm certainly open to any questions that you may have. I want to make sure I say this, too, because I know that James Goins will be coming up from my office. We are doing some restructuring in our office. Um, you all will be hearing about that. One of the things we want to make sure that we're giving you all is we are not just Title IX. While we are certainly proud of our Title IX part unit, we have a diversity um, division. We have an innovation um, uh, division. And we want to make sure that every single thing is running smoothly. And so as a part of coming in as new, you know sometimes you have to restructure and you have to make sure that we're doing everything we can. We're looking at professional development for our staff so that when we produce things to you that you know that we've done it with a great heart and all the values of this university respect accountability appreciation curiosity and service and so I hope that you guys will be pleased with us feel free to come to us anytime you have any questions um, we're here to partner and collaborate and we look forward to a future with you um, throughout not just year but more to come
Potomac State or Tech, if you guys have any questions, I'm certainly open to that, as well as Morgantown. No questions? No oh, why? Wow. All right, I'll take it. Thanks. Okay, so next on the agenda is James Goins, uh, our Title IX director. Good afternoon, everyone. I certainly uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak in front of this group. Uh, again, give you a quick update on what we've been doing in regards to uh, Title IX. Uh, first, I want to start by thanking all the faculty who have assisted us over the years. We can't do this work without you. Many of you uh, report, many of you assist uh, with interim measures and resources, so we certainly uh, thank you for that. Uh, we've had some uh, changes in our organizational structure. Uh, I'll remind you that uh, on December the 2017th, uh, Vice President uh, Fryson assumed his new role as Senior Advisor to President uh, Gee. Uh, President Gee then wasted no time in ad identifying some new talent, uh, uh, very uh, bright, very gifted, uh, uh, very eager to get, get moving, uh, Vice President Misha Poor, who you've just, just heard from. I'm happy to report that she's a very quick study and is making many, many changes, and we look forward uh, to her continued work. We also, uh, for the first time, hired a new uh, children on campus, so we call it an educational outreach specialist. Uh, this person is to assist us in all the ways that children are on our campus. I was happy to hear the provost report about all the student activities or the children on campus activities with the STEM uh, program. Uh, so we will have be monitoring every way that children are on campus. We will be making sure that people are properly trained, properly vetted. Uh, background checks have been done in a timely uh, fashion. Uh, so we appreciate uh, Courtney Simmons who joined our team and she has reached out to a number of folks to discuss their programs. I hope you'll welcome her uh, and spend some time with her. You'll also note our new organizational chart here. Uh, we've had a, uh, a few changes there, Misha has dis discussed. Uh, one of the things we are doing is looking to hire a new Title IX investigator. If anyone knows anyone with good credentials, we're happy to have them uh, come our way, so appreciate any help you can give us. Uh, part of our equity assurance training under the uh, direction of Assistant Director uh, Mariana Matthews, uh, some help from Christina Jacobs and, and, and Sam Wilmoth, we've had aggressive, an aggressive Title IX a campaign where we facilitated over 231 live Title IX trainings uh, this academic year. Uh, for the first time, we were happy to be able to uh, host a number of online modules for our students prior to them actually stepping foot on campus. That was a new thing that we were able to accomplish this year. Uh, we hope that makes a difference. 5,733 new students trained, 733 new employees trained online, and almost 5,000 individuals changed, uh, trained on our children on campus policy uh, this past year. Uh, we also think it important to note that effective February 13, 2018, that the institution uh, underwent a transition uh, away from Policy 44, our non-discrimination policy, uh, to Rule 1.6 and for Rule 1.7 for our uh, Rule on Child Protection. Uh, we appreciate all those that were able to participate in the open comment period. Uh, we thank General Counsel for their, their work in getting this uh, done. But we want to make sure that you, uh, everybody's aware that we have new rules uh, in place. Uh, this past academic year, uh, part of our investigation and services, we've uh, done a total of 194 investigations. Uh, we've had an additional 74 call for resource reports that we've had to complete. Uh, and our peer advocates have helped us with our 24-7 hotline. They've answered uh, 54 uh, or attended to 54 cases in 2017, uh, 40 in 2018. And we've hosted a number of uh, Title IX events in regards to our It's On Us, it's on Us campaign. Uh, hosted, as you can see, 190 awareness events, engaging over 14,000 uh, students. Uh, been a part of tabling events on all campuses, uh, resource fairs, uh, international student orientation, a ton of bystander training intervention programs. Uh, partnered with uh, different groups to do alcohol education and, and sexual health dis uh, discussions. Uh, showed awareness movies and had some panel discussions this year. Uh, 
worked with our local law enforcement agency to put on some protect classes and some empowerment programs. People tend to like those. Uh, we've worked with our athletics uh, to get our messages out at the football games, basketball games, and, uh, and, and baseball games. Uh, we've certain, uh, recently started a partnership with ROTC, uh, uh, doing some relationship and ex uh, exploitation training. They've been great partners. Uh, we've participated in the National One Love Peer-to-Peer -peer Training Program. Uh, had some human trafficking awareness discussion, cultural competency, microaggressions. Uh, try to stay hip on the social media, which we're trying to do that. Uh, and we've uh, participated in a number of anti-violence awareness uh, events this academic year. Uh, we continue to remain uh, very proud of our WU Peer Advocate Program. Uh, these students serve as a very valuable uh, resource to the university and to our students. Uh, we certainly appreciate the vision of the provost uh, who thought that it would be very appropriate that we uh, train these students in an academic type session where we started out with $42 and some free pizza and some people from the community to assist us. Uh, but since then, we now have a three-section service and learning course that finally has faculty and senate uh, approved in 2018, so we're very thankful uh, for that, and we're very thankful for these students. Uh, these students have, uh, we've already trained 316 students under this program. Uh, they've assisted with a number of anonymous complaints uh, every year that they've been in existence. Uh, they respond to a 24-hour live, 24-7, uh, equity assurance hotline, no matter day or, day or night, they show up. Uh, and they've almost completed 13,000 voluntary service hours. I think that's to be, uh, be commended of, of our students. And they're gaining uh, so much support. We've got 57 students from 25 different majors working in our office for free. Somebody should say they like free. I like free. And a part of our social media uh, campaign, uh, we've done 434,681 interactions, 11,000 uh, profile engagements on Twitter, uh, 22,290 interactions on Facebook, 507 page views. Everybody tells me that's good, so I'm going I'm to stick with that. <laughs> so if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to uh, take them. Tech, any questions at Tech? No questions. Thank you. Uh, Potomac State? No question, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I had one, one quick question. You had, you had mentioned uh, background checks. Um, is that something that's like handled or initiated from, from your office with there's like, you know, for children on campus uh, policies, is that handled through your office or initiated or is it another unit that does that? Uh, there's, there's, there's two parts to that. We're trying, that's why we try to get Courtney Simmons uh, yeah, uh, very familiar to everyone who has these uh, programs. Uh, she's worked uh, very, uh, a whole lot with 4-H and Extension, uh, certainly uh, are familiar with our HR, our personnel. Uh, people will uh, request background checks. HR will do those uh, background checks. Certainly athletics uh, have a number that they do as well. Those results go to us. And then we have a discussion uh, about whether someone should be allowed to uh, participate in a program or not. Any other uh, questions? Okay, cool. Thank you. All right, so next up is Ken and Damien uh, Clement. So uh, from Honors College, um, and I think as I understand on Thursday, you had your honors uh, ceremony, and I was happy to see that all, I went to six of the ceremonies this past weekend. I was, I was happy to see all the gold uh, gowns out there in the audience, so Ken. Thanks, mate. So uh, we've gone through a couple changes uh, since I last talked to you, and uh, I think we have slides somewhere. There we go. Okay. Fantastic. Let's take a page down. So uh, one of the biggest changes that we've done since I last talked to you is that uh, we have a new uh, assistant dean in the Honors College, is Dr. Damian Clement, uh, and he's a faculty member down in the College of Physical Activity and Sports Science, and uh, he has joined us uh, and replaced Dr. Claycomb, who's now the interim director of the Humanities Center. And uh, because Dr. Clement is uh, basically overseeing the front half of our honors program, you may remember that we transitioned from a single four-year honors program to two two-year programs. We have a program for first and second year students. Uh, that is our honors foundation program, and Dr. Clement basically oversees that. 
and we have a program for juniors and seniors that we're just building, uh, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But in the short run, I'd uh, like Dr. Clement to tell you a little bit about where we are with the Honors Foundation program and the Honors Faculty Fellows. Dr. Clement. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Uh, so as Dean Blevins that we um, transitioned this academic year into having the Honors Foundation program on the upper division program. One thing I want to let you know is that the 2017-2018 junior, uh, sophomores and juniors are still under the old program in the sense that they're still deans in presidential honors. So don't get any, um, want to at least let you let you know that. Uh, just to kind of let you know what this program is about, Honors Foundation program generally looking at the freshman and sophomore years uh, for these students looking to enrich their general education. Now we know that some honors students are going to be able to get some of their honors coursework within their majors, but we're thinking that the majority of them are probably going to just be using these general education courses in order to, to meet their honors requirements. Now as part of this honors requirement, they have to complete five honors courses, 13 credits. They need to meet both benchmarks, and one of the simple ways that I look at it in terms of explaining it to students, you have four semesters that you're in the program. If you take a three, semester, a three credit course each semester, three, six, nine, 12, and then that last course would be an honors orientation course, which is a zero credit course, which when paired with your first year experience course or first year seminar course, would give you 13, 13 credits. Uh, these students are going to be evaluated at the end of each academic year, as opposed to the students in the old program who are evaluated uh, after each semester. We're looking at having a 3.0 cumulative and honors GPA after their first year, and then after their second year, we're looking at a 3.0 cumulative GPA and a 3.5 honors GPA. When we think of the honors program, some of the benefits that we tell students with regards to the honors foundation program, you get access to innovative courses that are not offered anywhere on campus that are only available to honors students. You get class sizes 25 and below, where you're focused on primarily discussion based as opposed to these lecture based courses. Access to honors housing. Uh, I'm not sure if you all are familiar. Uh, Lincoln Hall, just across the way, there is now an honors residence hall on Evansdale campus, in addition to our downtown campus. And of course, priority registration, which is you know, one of the other perks of being a member of the um, honors college. Last thing I want to talk about is the Honors Faculty Fellow Program. So to put a plug for any interested faculty members out there that are interested in participating in this program, I think I saw Renee somewhere somewhere out there, and Rhonda is probably somewhere out there as well. Uh, this is, we put out a call for this probably, November 15 is gonna be the deadline, so early fall, we're gonna send out this call. We're looking for innovative courses, courses that have not been taught anywhere on campus before. We in the Honors College view ourselves as uh, pioneers, incubators for, um, for, for different things. So if you have an idea of a course that you think you wanna teach, come to us, we can, um, we can probably try and make that happen. The goal of this program is for you to try this course within the Honors College with the Honors population, and if it works really successfully and something you want to take back to your college and, and program, we are, we are open to that. If you look at those courses up there, some pretty unique, innovative type of courses, different type of courses, uh, these courses are also all GEF courses as well. And one of the things that we did differently this year, for those of you all who advise Honors students, we capped these courses at 13, I believe, for fall registration. So when new student orientation comes up next month, we're going to have at least half of all these courses available for our incoming honor students to, to take. We're really hoping that we can have some young, vibrant, you know, well, how do you say it? Um, anxious freshman honor students paired with some upper class honor students, and we think that's going to be a pretty cool dynamic within those, within those classes. So. I think I'll pass it on to Ken and he can, he can finish this up. So uh, just to tell you where, where we are with numbers, uh, you know, we've grown significantly over the last few years. Uh, we're projecting right now an incoming class of 1,000 students, plus or minus 20. Uh, last fall, we were at 921. So uh, again, we've gone up quite a bit and uh, we're really happy about that. Currently, we have 975 students who have made a deposit. So we uh, feel pretty strongly we'll get to 1,000 or so. Um, this past year, we, uh, as you can see there, right there, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors for a total right around 2,500 honor students. Uh, and so that's what our numbers are looking like right now. 
So I just wanted to say a, a word about the upper division. I guess maybe I'll back up one, one second. Is, um, you know, part of the growth in the Honors College, I think, is we are attracting more better students to this university. And I think that's, uh, first, that's a reflection on the, the things that the faculty do in the classes and in the laboratory. So I just wanted to give you that shout out. Uh, and also then a plea in the same hand. So we'll need more honors courses and honor seats. So uh, if you would like to have that conversation, be glad to work with you and your chair to see what sorts of things we can arrange. With respect to the upper division program, uh, I can't tell you very much about it, uh, and that's on purpose uh, because we, uh, it's an experiential based learning program. Uh, it will probably contain some coursework. I don't know exactly what it will look like. Uh, we have uh, brought on Dr. Dana Hubert Lima. She will be the director of the upper level uh, program. Uh, she's to work with the honors program 50% over a 12 month period. And so she'll start building that uh, uh, May 21st, I think is her first day. So pretty quickly she'll be on that. So uh, you'll certainly be here uh, more about that in the future. Um, and the other thing that I wanna tell you about is uh, the thing that uh, Damien had pointed out, right? So the, again, the students that are coming in this fall and the students that were here last fall, they are in that new honors foundation program which does not have this old honors for A's thing that we're working, at least I am, working hard to get rid of. So the students that are juniors and seniors this coming academic year still have that honors for A's and it will, it will go away with them. So uh, we'll be looking certainly then for more real honors courses at that point in time. So uh, with that, we uh, both would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. So Potomac State, did you have any questions? No questions, sir, thank okay. you. Okay, Tech, did you have any questions? No questions, thank you. Okay, am I allowed to ask a question? Oh, no, okay. absolutely. So, you know, going through graduation, you know, I saw a lot of gold gowns. I'm wondering, under, now that we have two different programs, um, you know, the foundation and upper division, um, what's gonna be on the diploma, and then are both kinds gonna be wearing the gold gown? Is that the idea? Great question. We spent too much time thinking about that, probably. So I, I think where we are is, I th uh, and collect, you, we don't have, I don't have this right. So one of the things is, uh, I think is really neat about the upper division program that we're building is you don't have to be in the, in the first program to be in the second program. So uh, it's a different uh, kind of program, and so we're excited about that. So theoretically, a person could be in just the first program, or just the second program, or both programs. And so uh, I think we have discerned that we, we have a space on a diploma and a transcript to put something. And uh, I, I, okay, good. And so uh, I think it's gonna say something like uh, University Honor Scholar, they just do the first half. We haven't decided, I think, what it says on the second half. But if they do both, I think we're leaning towards something called like a honors laureate, and we'll do something fancy with them. Uh, what was the other question? I think I got that. Oh, the gown, right, so if you do the first program, you get the gown, you do this, or the second program, you get the gown, you do both programs, you get the gown and the medallion. Score, all right, you got it, okay. Or, or you could just have three different colored gowns, oh, no. maybe. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so next on the agenda is statement of candidates for uh, the Board of Governors. So we now have an opportunity to hear from our two candidates for the position of Board of Governors representative. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the ballots are gonna go out tomorrow, uh, and this person will represent the entire university, uh, but they have to come from uh, either Extension or Health Sciences. Uh, and the term will begin um, almost immediately. It'll, it'll begin July 2018 and run through uh, June 2020. Okay, so as I mentioned, ballots will be sent tomorrow and close for, um, Tuesday, May 22nd at 5 p.m. Okay. Uh, you can read uh, the candidate's written statements in Annex 1A. Uh, so at this point, each candidate will be given three minutes and uh, to make a brief attachment, a, a brief statement, okay. Um, so you get three minutes uh, and unfortunately we can't take any questions, okay. Um, so random uh, drawing, determine the order, and so first up is Stan Heilman from Health Sciences. Uh, Stan? Go. <laughs> all right, thank you, Matt. First of all, let me say uh, a big thank you for allowing me to serve as your uh, faculty representative of the Board of Governors for the past two years. 
Uh, when Bob Griffith originally nominated me two years ago, I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, but it's been a very uh, rewarding, uh, yet interesting and educational experience to see how such a complex place operates on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but that experience has also made it very clear to me that uh, we as a faculty need to have, a, have some very strong voices on the Board of Governors. It's actually a very uh, impressive, as you might guess, and wonderful, wonderfully nice group of people. But it becomes clear uh, after a while that, that they don't always completely understand how a university operates from an academic side of things. Um, so I think it's critical that uh, the faculty and staff perspective for that matter are uh, elevated with a great deal of clarity. And it's my belief and hope uh, that our former uh, Senate president that was on the board, Richard Turton, Matt, and myself have uh, done our absolute best to make sure that's happened uh, over the past few years. And I think they would also agree that the relationships that we cultivate uh, with the other board members go a long way in having our voices heard and respected. Um, I'll give you a couple examples. Last year, I was tasked with talking to the board about uh, where WVU stands with regard to faculty salaries. And as you might guess, uh, the data on that was not overly exciting. We, we came in as about a 10% deficit to, to our peers, no matter how you cut it. Um, fast forward, we are now currently working uh, on a five-year plan to hopefully really elevate faculty salaries and staff salaries for that matter. Uh, and hopefully there's a, a commitment for that to happen. Now, as you've probably guessed at this point, that was probably not due to my amazing oratory skills. Uh, but I think it was more due in part to the relationships that we'd built uh, over the last couple years with some board members who really pushed for that. And I think it would also be due to the fact that we have a president and a provost that listens and realizes that if we're going to be our absolute best as a university, that's an issue that needs to be addressed and needs to be fixed. Um, we've also spent a good deal of time, as Matt's mentioned, uh, rewriting the former policies of the Higher Education Policy Commission into our, our, into our own rules. This has been a lot of work, but it's also been a great opportunity to kind of reshape what we do in order for this university to function in a very efficient way. Um, I think it's important, though, because a lot of those rules have to do with how we function as a faculty and that environment within which we do function. And so it's important as well to have uh, a faculty voice in those processes as well. Um, as Matt mentioned, while this, this position is a health sciences or extension position, it's very important and critical to realize that it represents the university as a whole. And I think the research and teaching and service missions that I'm a part of will be important in that regard. Because as one of my favorite TV characters, Red Green likes to say, we're all in this together, right? So uh, with that, I hope you'll give me the opportunity to continue to represent you for the next two years as your Board of Governors representative. Thank you. Okay. All right, so next up is uh, Jason Burnside. Extension. You'll, uh, you'll stand up when I... Stand to, up to cut me off, right? Stop. Done with Thanks. My goal is to be done before he stands up. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Jason Burnside. Uh, I'm Extension out of Harrison County, and I work with the 4-H program. I assure you I am not a student imposter, uh, and I'm, in fact, <laughs> older than I, uh, I look. So um, <laughs> I hope that my youth uh, would bring an, an interesting new perspective uh, to this role, uh, and, I, and also... Um, I hope you wouldn't think that uh, as a barrier uh, to my serving in this position. Um, it would be easy for me to stand up here and talk about all of the many hats that I wear in the extension service and the different programs that I help to deliver around Harrison County and uh, the state. Um, but I'm here uh, today to, to ask you to uh, let me represent all of the faculty of the university. Uh, that would be very important to me. So uh, the university is very large. I've had a, uh, an interesting experience as a, uh, an ECI and a, a graduate assistant in many different roles in our university uh, that I could bring um, to this position to be able to help uh, represent uh, all of the faculty. Um, I've been an active uh, participant on faculty senate committees uh, with the service committee and the uh, student uh, conduct, uh, the rights and responsibilities committee as well. Um, so I do take an active role there. Um, the, the 
most that I can say uh, for, for me asking to be able to represent you is uh, I, I connect with people. I connect with people young and old. I connect with people daily. Uh, the people of West Virginia, I take uh, our university to them. Uh, that's my job. Uh, and so it would be great for me to take the, the faculty of this university to the Board of Governors. Thank you. Okay, so let's see. Next on the agenda, Curriculum Committee report. Ralph. Hello. Um, I think I'm going to move the first three items at the same time for approval, annexes one, two, and three. Um, the new course report, course changes, deletions, and adoptions report, and the capstone courses report. Okay. Do you want to do the majors too, or do you, you want to do We can, if that's okay. We just, just, just do it all. Do it all. We'll be bold so, um, and do all, all, everything. So a new major in multidisciplinary studies mm -hmm. for Potomac State, mm -hmm. and a new major in technical art history. So there's five items here, annexes one, two, three, and two new majors. Um, are there any objections or points of discussion for these? Um, Potomac State, do you have any questions, uh, objections, or points of discussion? No, sir. No questions or points of discussion. Okay. Tech, uh, any objections or points of discussion? No, we don't. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. In that case, then all in favor of approving annexes one, two, and three and the two majors, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, t uh, Potomac State, how do you vote? Two ayes. Okay. Uh, tech, how do you vote? Tech votes five ayes. Okay, thank you. Um, annexes one, two, and three, uh, and the new majors are approved. Okay, and next we have the four information items, a new minor in accounting, um, a new minor in marketing, a new minor in professional sales, um, and then finally, the graduate programs report, which is Annex 4. Okay. Are there any questions or points of discussion for the three new minors or Annex 4? Uh, Potomac State, any questions or points of discussion? None. Thank you, sir. Okay. Tech, any questions or points of discussion? No question or points of discussion. Okay. Hearing no further questions, uh, the three new minors in Annex 4 are filed. Okay. Anything else, Ralph? That's okay. all. All right, Thanks. great. Thank you. All right, so next we have Jeff report okay, from I've... Natalie. Okay. There we go. Okay, right. I have two announcements. Uh, the first is that the moratorium, moratorium on new Jeff courses has been lifted as of, yes, right. April 25th. Yay. Okay, so that's good news. That's good news. Okay, okay uh, another announcement. Uh, so, um, Music 118, which is a new course, was mistakenly approved at the March 26th Faculty Senate meeting uh, as a GEC to GEF transition. But it was a new course then. There was still a moratorium, so that class had to be rolled back. Um, and so uh, we uh, can officially approve it, but we have not yet. Okay? Right. Does that make sense? Yes. Well, okay. Not, okay. So, sort okay. Of? so, we, so we had this course, Music 118, yes. that we approved, but we really shouldn't as a, have approved. Well, we so it, we approved. It, we approved it appeared as a four. It, it, it appeared as a, a, a four, four approval uh, information, oh, item information item as a transition. Item. Okay. Yes, uh, but it was a new course. Okay. So we actually have to approve it. Okay. So we'll have to approve it, but we're yes. not going to approve it today. We're going to. We can't it. approve it today. Right. It has to go up through the. Yes. Ranks. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's it. exactly right. All right. Everyone got that? Okay. There'll be a quiz on this later. Yep. All right, so those are the two announcements. And then I have a correction. So um, Jeff uh, deletions Annex 5 is a for approval item oh, right. and not a for information item. Okay. Okay. So we have one for approval item, Annex 5, uh, CDFS 250. It violates the expectations of a Jeff course, so it has uh, two prerequisites, so it appears to be only for majors. Um, okay. So the course initiator and the department chair have been notified that okay. the class is a okay. deletion. All right, and they're okay. Yeah, well, you all know. Right. Okay, so, <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So in that case, we have uh, one for approval item, which is Annex 5, okay? Yes. Um, so first of all, are there any objections or points of discussion on Annex 5? Okay, Potomac State, Annex 5 is an approval item. Uh, do you have any uh, objections or points of discussion? 
Not at this time. Okay. And tech, uh, do you have any uh, objections or points of discussion for Annex 5? No objections, no points of discussion. Okay. okay. Got it. Um, okay, so now we can approve it because it's an approval item. So all those in favor of approving Annex 5, say aye. Aye. Okay, so Annex, uh, then Potomac State, uh, how do you vote? Two ayes, sir. Okay. And Tech, how do you vote on Annex 5? Tech votes five aye. Okay, so Annex 5 uh, passes, and then we have a for information item. Yes, and that is Annex 6, so the Jeff Transition Review. Okay. Uh, 31 so courses. are there any... Um, Objections or points of discussion for Annex 6? Uh, Potomac State, any objections or points of discussion for Annex 6? No, sir. Okay, and Tech, do you have any uh, questions or points of discussion for Annex 6? No objection, no points of discussion. Thank okay. you. Okay, so hearing none, Annex 6 is filed as a for information item. Okay, anything else? That's it. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so next, next is the report from faculty representative to state government Roy Nutter. Um, and Roy um, called me from his uh, RV and said he's driving across country. He forgot to tell us earlier, but um, <laughs> said, okay, I said, fine. I said, fine. Um, we'll just get the, um, there is a, a backup representative to the ACF. And he said, yeah, we'll get the backup. Oh, and by the way, you're the backup. So I kind of forgot I was a backup, but I am indeed the uh, alternate uh, faculty representative to state government. So I will give the report. And this is what Roy, I'll just read Roy's report. So, Roy attended the ACF meeting on April 19th at the Advanced Technology Center in Fairmont, part of Pierpont Community and Technical College. The most notable discussion was around the erosion of tenure at Fairmont State University and Concord University. Um, th there's been some new uh, rules there uh, approved by the Board of Governors that take away some of the tenure protections at those schools. Um, there's also a report that Glenville State College has been has seen tremendous growth in their student population, and they're spending 1.6 million dollars to renovate a hotel for student housing. It's uh, kind of interesting. And Glenville State they they are they come out favorable, don't they, in the funding model? Or I can't remember. No, they don't. They don't. Okay. So, all right. So that's the um, the report. Um, I'm not going to take any questions because I can't answer any. Um, <laughs> and then next. Um, the Board of Governors report, I'm the alternate for that, but uh, fortunately, Stan is here, so uh, Board of Governors report. All right, thanks, Matt. Um, so the last Board of Governors meeting we had, uh, we actually approved for comment Rule 5.1 regarding fiscal responsibility. We approved Rules 4.1 through 4.6. We also heard a report from Lisa Martin, who represented the classified staff on the Board of Governors. Um, some numbers you might be interested in. She noted that there were 2,241 classified staff positions, and that represented a decrease in 622 positions since 2014. And she noted that 38% of those positions that they have now are eligible to retire by 2020. Um, we heard a report from the Student Government Association. Uh, the president is Blake Humphrey, and they went through a lot of the different things that they've been involved in in the past year and some of the reorganization has occurred under his leadership. And I think Matt would agree, I would add that Blake has been an absolutely outstanding student representative to the Board of Governors over the past year. Um, he also introduced the incoming president, Isaac Obiama, and the vice president, Abby Iaccini. Um, Isaac will take Blake's place on the Board of Governors, so we look forward to working with them, hopefully. Um, recognized Dixie Martinelli for years of service on the Board of Governors as a staff representative. As some of you may have heard uh, through the media that we held an emergency Board of Governors meeting on 510, and that was actually just to be informed of the $5 million gift from Milan in support of the STEM education initiative via the existing 4-H infrastructure. And then finally, we'll have a meeting on the 18th of uh, the, this week to consider rules 2.1 through 2.5 and 4.7, which Matt mentioned uh, earlier, and this will also be a meeting that we'll consider uh, the tuition and fee increases for next year. And I would add that Matt and I will be doing the um, faculty Board of Governors report at the meeting in June. Any questions for Stan? Okay. Um, moving on, we have um, two housekeeping items to tend to. Um, and so item 14 is for confirmation appointment of faculty Senate representative to state government. So according to our Constitution, this, this representative has to be appointed, appointed by the Executive Committee 
uh, subject to confirmation by the full execu uh, full Senate. So, um, so our job now is to confirm uh, this position. So um, there's only one person who actually expressed interest, and that was Roy Nutter, who's been doing it for a few years. Um, and uh, an exec reappointed him at our last meeting. Um, and so um, thank you, Roy, for willingness to serve. And um, so with that in mind, at this point, we just need to confirm Roy Nutter for the position of representative state government for the 2018 to 19 academic year. Um, so all those in favor of the confirmation, uh, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, Potomac State, how do you vote? Two ayes, sir. Okay, and Tech, how do you vote? Tech votes five ayes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, Roy Nutter is uh, confirmed for this position. Okay, so next is uh, confirmation appointment of parliamentarian. Um, and I was telling Chad, I was hoping that we would have a uh, parliamentarian first before faculty representative state government, because then I could appear to be very confused and ask him lots of questions as a way to test his ability to do a parliamentarian procedure. Uh, but unfortunately, we did this backwards. So don't get to poke any fun at him. But basically, it works the same way. Um, we have to, the exec uh, appoints him, Senate approves him. Uh, exec has already appointed Chad Proudfoot, he's done a fa fabulous job, and we've appointed him to do it for one more year, and so we're asking you then to confirm him. So um, with that in mind, um, I ask then how many of you are in favor of approving Chad Proudfoot for the position of parliamentarian for the 2018-19 academic year? All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Okay, opposed? Okay, Potomac State, how do you vote? Two ayes. Okay, Tech, how do you vote? Check votes, five ayes. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Chad, you are reappointed. Did I do that okay? Oh. Yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> I was trying to fumble a little there, but it didn't work. Okay. Is there any new business? Uh, Potomac State, do you have any new business? No new business on okay. our end, sir. <laughs> all right. Tech, do you have any new business? No new business. Thank okay. you, Mr. Do you have a, mo a motion to adjourn? Is there a second? Okay, uh, thank you, we are adjourned.